Okay, so we're going to talk in this session and invite some thoughts from you as well about how to engage in active learning activities in a bichronous or a high flex class. And just to set the stage a little bit, we should define these. Um, bichronous is a term that I never heard of until last year um, because it was a type of teaching that we never really engaged in <laughs> very extensively at least. It has occurred in some classes. I know the School of Ed have done this at Oswego for actually about 15 years or so with one or two courses. Um, but it's basically where you have some people in person and some people online. Um, although actually I think they were fully remote synchronous. So the pandemic brought us this new way of teaching. Um, some of us were doing this to a limited extent for about 12 to 14 years, maybe 15 years. Once I had a camera installed in my large class, I did allow students to attend remotely. And we've actually been doing workshops that way since long before the pandemic um, for at least at least since 2008. So we essentially it's when people can participate either in the room with you or they're participating remotely online in some way um, from a distance. Um, so that was certainly common with the hybrid instruction that occurred during the version of hybrid instruction that <laughs> occurred here during the pandemic, where class size was shrunk. Some students attended on certain days in person and um, on other days they attended remotely and it would switch. Um, but it's also been something that many of us have continued to do because we're finding a lot more students are getting are testing positive. Uh, they have to be out now for only five days instead of 10. Um, but we also have seen a lot of students who've come to expect that if their car breaks down, if they are hospitalized, I have one student who is in the hospital for much of the, the last semester, um, but she was able to participate in class from her hospital room because she had a laptop there and she had access to Wi-Fi. Um, so bichronous is basically some students are there, some students are participating with the class remotely. And high, high flex is basically bichronous plus students have the option of participating entirely online in in their own time. So basically it's an asynchronous online course as an option for every class meeting. So if you're teaching in a bichronous meeting, some students may be in the room, some students may be remote on Zoom, and some students might skip out entirely. If you're teaching a high flex class, some students might be in the room, some people might be remote, and some people will be doing the equivalent type of learning activities on their own time. So with high flex, it's adding one more modality. It's like you're teaching an online class and a synchronous class at the same time, but students are able to choose on a daily basis for every class meeting, which modality they're in. And that has some additional complication, but we're going to focus on the bichronous aspect of it because that is in common to both of these. Okay, <laughs> got a little ahead on the slides. So there's some challenges. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of challenges that, um, you know, come about with Bicronus instruction. Um, first, that most classrooms don't have microphone arrays that will pick up all of the voices in the classroom. So for the most part, all of our classrooms, well, not all of our classrooms, but um, many of our classrooms are, you know, equipped with a webcam, which has a built-in microphone, but that is, you know, uh, focused on the um, person at the front of the room and it's picking up that person's voice typically. Um, and so if a student in the back wants to offer a comment or question uh, and they do so, it may not be picked up by that microphone. So people who are attending remotely in a synchronous online format uh, may not hear what their classmates are saying. And so it becomes difficult for them to engage with each other um, when not all of the voices in the classroom are heard. That happened this morning in one of our workshops. Um, we should have brought lavalier mics, but we decided to try using an omnidirectional, a very nice omnidirectional microphone that is much better nice. than the ones in the web camera. 
but I walked a little bit forward to talk to some of the people in the room. And because my back was to the microphone, it just didn't pick up very much to my audio, which is something I should have realized. Uh, when I'm in a classroom teaching in a bichronous mode, I'm always wearing a lavalier microphone. So wherever I wanted to, mm -hmm. students could hear me, but they couldn't hear other students. So I either have to um, clip the lavalier mic and hold it in front of the person, mm -hmm. or I'd have to repeat what the student said, um, which can add a little bit of delays mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and one of the other problems though with Bicronus instruction is if you, most of, many of the active learning activities involve students working together in real time, talking to each other. And that becomes much more challenging in a Hyflex or Bicronus environment where you don't necessarily know who will be in the room and who won't be on any given day. And it's hard to communicate in voice between some students who are in person and some students who are remote. So it's easy for people who are remote to participate in breakout rooms and groups. It's easy for people in the room to be able to talk to each other. But if they're working in groups where students in the room are trying to talk to people remotely, that becomes much more of a challenge, even if you do have good microphone environments, because a good microphone environment will pick up all the sounds in the room <laughs> unless you can switch them off in some way. Uh, so it only picks up the people you want to be heard. Um, and John had just mentioned this, um, but you know, with a um, bicronus uh, modality, there can be potentially a different mix of students who are attending in person and who are attending remotely each class day. Um, so that uh, really limits your ability to create uh, persistent groups. So, you know, if you were to have, um, you know, four students in a group and they were expected to complete um, group work throughout your course, um, some of them might be remote, some of them might be in person. Um, and, and that really, um, you know, because of the communication issues um, that exist by kind of crossing those modalities, becomes very difficult to um, engage in persistent groups um, during class sessions. Um, and as the instructor, it's really difficult to plan those group activities. So if you, you know, want uh, a minimum of four people in a group, let's say it's not even a persistent group, but you want four people in a group, well, maybe you only have two or one student who's attending uh, remotely that day. And so that student or those, you know, students um, that are remote, you know, don't get that same level of group um, input that students who might be in attending in person that day. So as an instructor, there really has to be a lot of flexibility in group activities and, um, and no expectations of the number of participants in each modality. So it pretty much rules out some of the, the best activities that involve persistent teams working on projects throughout the semester. And also, if you're planning activity where you need groups of at least three, there may be some days where all but one student is online or all but one student is in the classroom. And then, you know, it's really hard to do group if you don't have the minimum number available for the group in one modality or the other. So you have to be very flexible and have lots of options available. And that's one of the things we want to talk about, what options might work. And also, this is an issue that we've all experienced, particularly when we did this for the first few times or the first few weeks. Um, I know when I was teaching my first, uh, in the fall, when I came back from remote instruction during the first year of the pandemic, I had a class of, of a small introductory class, the smallest one I've ever taught here, mm -hmm. with about 189 students in it. But on any given day, there'd be 10 or 20 or 30 or sometimes 40 students who were out either because they were ill or because they didn't make it to class on time or whatever, but they were participating over Zoom. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of a challenge keeping up with the chat, keeping up with the, the um, direct messages and so forth while working in the classroom itself. And in particular, you know, I had to be able to monitor the chat, which kind of tied me to the podium. Apparently not enough because I did end up getting COVID myself that semester. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, it's a bit tougher managing both the breakout rooms and groups as and all, keeping up with the chat and so forth there and 
monitoring activities in the classroom and still being able to wander around uh, the classroom. So it is a bit of work. It does get a bit easier. Now, one thing that's really essential and that we don't really have on our campus, uh, despite many of our requests for many, many years, um, is having a second monitor because what I'm using right now is a second monitor. So I can see the chat, I can see the list of participants and so forth. And that's that's kind of essential if you're going to be teaching this way. There are some workarounds. You could bring your own laptop and use that as a second login. But given the authentication, that's become a little bit more complex because you used to be able to log in without authentication in, in your account um, as a second user, but only one account can be the, the administrator of Zoom for the session or can, um, can be the host of the session. And if you log in on your device, you lose that hosting rights because you get logged out. But you could create your own personal account and just make sure you set up the class, the class to not restrict users to members of the Oswego community, which is one of the security things. So the authentication actually may end up making your sessions less secure. But that, again, is something we have no control over. But a second, a second device that logs in, which could be a smartphone or tablet or a laptop, will give you at least a second screen so you can see what's happening in the chat and so forth. Um, I didn't have that one day in my classes this spring, and I started getting some direct messages from students. And that's when you have two screens, that's no problem because you're sharing a screen with the class and you're sharing a screen with the remote session, which is generally a screen like we're using here for the presentation. But I was in the classroom, which as pretty much all of our classrooms have is only one screen. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know whether to click on that direct message because if I do, it becomes visible, not to the remote participants because that's not shared out, but everyone in the classroom where about 60% of the class was that particular day would be able to see any private messages that were being sent. And if it was some, it could be something where someone was saying, the microphone isn't working. And that's something I really like to know. So I was placed in this quandary where I'd have to share this and it also gets ended up on the recording as well. Well, depending on how you're recording. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a bit more work if you're going to be having students remotely yeah. and in person. And if you have only one monitor or one screen, it's it's not possible to do it as well as you'd like to do. And I think many of us, when we went remote, picked up second screens just so you'd have a staging area where you mm -hmm. could have any polls or other things or slides or lists of resources that we could then drag over to the chat without having to constantly jump back and forth between windows. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be teaching this modality, and I know many of us have been all year, um, it's really helpful to have, if not a second screen, at least a second device logged in. Mm -hmm. And one thing that happens with the high flex modality, and this is why a lot of schools have actually cut back on this while we're moving towards this, um, is that we end up with, in a high flex modality, a lot of variance in attendance. And if students perceive that one modality is a little bit easier, a little less threatening, or a little bit less work, they may end up moving that way. And I know some people have taught in this at other institutions. We haven't really not much with this here, where all the students ended up shifting to asynchronous, or they all ended up to being remote synchronous. And it's a bit harder to plan activities when you don't know how many total students will be there synchronously. You know, with a by mode, with a by um, chronist environment, you'll get some people there, some people remote, but most or all of your students would be there. And one thing that I can say happened this spring when I was teaching entirely in my face-to-face -face classes in a bichronous environment, because I just had all, in one class, all the students ended up with COVID at some point during the semester. And again, I mentioned one student was out in the hospital for well over half of the semester. And then I had a student stuck in Pakistan coming back from spring break, he had been as a family. I had another person who was horribly stuck in Cancun after spring break, but they were participating in some cases from the airport and they were still engaged. And my attendance was the best I've ever seen. I, in, in my uh, capstone course, I had close to 100% attendance all through the semester, but I never had all the students in that particular class in the room at the same time. They were giving presentations every week, each and every student is part of a group, but they were never all there at the same time. So it does give us the ability to bring in students 
who otherwise wouldn't be able to be there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's helpful. In high flex, though, you never know who might show up in synchronously. So and I think, yeah, and I think that all kind of speaks to the cognitive load, right? Because you're, you you know, to try to work around some of these challenges, it's a lot of, you know, mental energy, even sometimes physical energy. I know you, you've you been carrying monitors and microphones and, you know, things to, you know, make the classroom, you know, work for you. But it is, you know, it is a lot. So it's definitely something to, you know, consider when you are um, teaching in, in these ways. Um, but on a brighter note, um, you know, there's, there are, you know, active learning techniques that we can incorporate um, that work in, you know, our bichronous um, modalities. Um, so um, polling software. So, you know, John had mentioned this, you know, that it was really helpful to have a second monitor to kind of facilitate this, but you can um, engage students in the classroom as well as those remotely um, in polling um, software. So Zoom has some polling software capabilities. It's not as great because it's anonymous, right? Which I would never um, use. I <laughs> did use it during a pandemic because that's all we had because it took a while for CTS, CTS to install the integration for iClicker. iClicker is free. It's incredibly yeah. powerful. It can be anonymous if you want it to be, but it can also be integrated with your gradebook. Yeah. And you've got a much wider variety of questions. It's easier to do it on the fly. And you can even do whiteboards, right? Um, or like um, chat boxes, right? With um, yeah. iClicker where students can enter in text, right? You do have short answer short options. Answer options. And one of the things you can do, it, especially it worked really mm -hmm. well in a large class. If I was getting a couple hundred responses in, you can do a word cloud to see which words were showing up the most. You know, yeah. if you ask students what their reactions were to the class or how it was going. You can do it anonymously and you get this word cloud where certain words would be bigger. That's really than nice. And you can get a general feel for the sense of the class and you can also look it over in more detail later. Mm -hmm. And that's really convenient. And it is all tied to individuals while the polling in, in, in Zoom is yeah. really limited and you have to set it up in advance and it's a lot more work and scrolling through and selecting. Yeah. And iClicker is free. It's more powerful and it's free. And there's a lot to be said for that. And if you do want yeah. to use Zoom polling and identify students, you have to force them to log into their accounts. You have to invite them individually for the class, and they're always going to mess up. It's, yeah. And, you know, and that's understandable yeah. because it's there's a lot, a lot of steps. Work, and yeah, and you're generally not expected that's to fair. do that. That's fair. So, you know, there's, um, you can, you know, have um, peer discussions and breakout rooms um, and in person. So you can, you know, have students talk about, um, you know, the results of those um, polling uh, questions, um, you know, so, and that doesn't have to be a persistent group. You can just, you know, pair people off into um, in fact, small this groups. Is a, this is something we've always been recommending is a methodology that Herb Mazurik suggested about 23 years ago now, I think it is, either 22 or 23 years ago, where basically he'll give a question, a challenging question that a lot of students will get wrong, and he'll pull them individually on it. And then he'll see the results. And now, because I only have one monitor in the classroom unless I bring one, mm -hmm. what, actually what I would do is I'd open it on my phone and I'd be able to see the results to see how they voted on the question the first time. And you can see numeric questions, a whole list of them, where you can mm -hmm. see if it's multiple choice, the mix of choices they made. And then you ask them to discuss it and to argue about it, to find well, when possible, to find someone with a different opinion. And in for the breakout rooms, you just randomly send students to room and have them discuss it and to argue it themselves mm -hmm. and to make a case for one argument over the other. And then you bring them back after a fixed amount of time. Um, and usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll judge how it's going in the classroom with the in-person people mm -hmm. to see when they converge on answers, wandering around as they do that. And then you have them vote again. And there's a tremendous amount of evidence that that leads to significant improvements in students' learning, mm -hmm. not just in the short term, but also in the long term in terms of the impact of the semester. And when students have been surveyed or when student performance has been measured a year later in subsequent classes, they end up remembering more and doing better in later classes that build on the classes where these have been used. And 
And in general, in chemistry and physics, the learning gains in terms of pre and post tests on particular topics have been in a range of double to triple the learning gains when clickers with peer discussion, as well as some just in time teaching are used compared to those where the same types of mm. instruction, readings, and lecture otherwise took place. So it's, it's a really powerful technique, and it works beautifully play with remote students because they just connect from the mobile devices or a different tab in the browser while they're doing the seeing the presentation with the questions on the screen. So other things you can incorporate into your classroom are games. Um, so a lot of students and faculty alike are familiar with Kahoot, which is a um, you can either make it team based or um, individual based, um, but it is essentially a series of uh, multiple choice and true and false questions that um, allow students to sort of compete um, by getting, you know, correct answers and their names will, um, you know, rise to the top if they are getting the most points. It's a, it's a fun game uh, for students to play, but, you know, people remotely can join in. Um, they can, you know, students who are in the classroom can, uh, if they have a mobile device or a browser, they can join in um, that way. Um, if someone in the classroom doesn't have a device, they can, you know, find a partner to share with. And, you know, there's there's a um, there's a few ways you can incorporate, um, you know, some kind of digital games into um, a bichromous uh, modality. And the nice thing with both Kahoot and Jeopardy, if you're using lower level questions, it helps build automaticity so that it gives you, it's using retrieval practice, but it's doing it in a way where some of the students' responses start to become automatic because mm -hmm. the speed of the response matters and you're not grading in any way. So it's kind of fun and it encourages students to work on developing an improved ability to recall basic concepts, which allows them to engage in higher level cognition and transfer applications. Mm -hmm. Uh, so exit tickets, uh, muddiest points, um, one minute quiz activities. So, you know, checking in with students on their learning um, in the classroom, you know, for that class session. So asking students, you know, what was the most surprising part of the lecture? What is, you know, something that they are um, still confused about or want to learn more about? Um, you can create, you know, really any of these um, using polls or Google Forms. You can um, send that out in a link if you're holding um, a synchronous online session with um, students over Zoom. You can put a link in a in the chat box. Uh, you can also create a QR oh. code for students who are in the classroom that they can access that at the same time. And preferably both. Yes. So Pref right, preferably, preferably both. Code yeah. So the students in the classroom can quickly yes. go to it. Um, okay. You know, if it's a poll, it'll be available to everyone. If you're using, right. say, iClicker, and again, you do have free response options there. Um, sure. But if, if you're using Google Forms or something similar, mm -hmm. you can just put up a QR code link to it. Nine so, and ten. Oh, and nine, starting nine ten. Okay. And, and so, uh, you know, and, what's nice about Google Forms, too, uh, is that there is a, um, you know, you can link that to a spreadsheet and it'll create graphs for you. So you can share, you know, the aggregate data from um, the results, you know, of, of students um, adding in that information if, if you um, so choose. So it's a there's there are nice ways you can kind of share that aggregate information in a fairly, you know, quick way, too. And there is some evidence that these techniques do increase student learning. Just the act of reflecting on what they learned in the class, thinking about what they don't really understand, and think about what they did learn that they didn't know before. In many studies, not all, but most studies have found that there is an increase in student learning and performance when they do that, when there's been at least quasi-experiments where some classes use this and some classes did not. And it only takes a minute or so at the end and if you are using a Google form, I use this actually in my uh, my large class a few times. I've tried it both at the end of class and I've also used it to help students get ready for class where I've given them a, um, I actually graded it as 5% of the grade, but before each class, I had to give them some readings they had to do. I had them watch some videos and then I asked them to submit some questions about, let's say the class met at 2.20, I asked them to submit questions by noon on that day related to the class using 
a form that I sent the link out to everyone in the class and I could skim through it and then I could say now two thirds of you mentioned you know some challenges understanding this so we're going to focus mostly on the things that you have questions about so we can use our class time more efficiently and it works really well doing it at the end of class works too and then you can come back in the next day saying these were issues that lots of people you know had some concerns about so we're going to start the class by going over that and discussing some of those and it, it shows that you're listening to them it shows that you're responding to their needs and it's letting you focus the time in class on the areas where they there is the most confusion so you don't have to spend as much time on that um, so there's a lot of ways you can do it but it does work very well regardless of what modality people mm -hmm. are in and so think pair share is another activity you can use for um, students remotely as well as in the classroom at the same time um, you know you can use breakout rooms to facilitate this so the idea with a think pair share is that you are um, posing a prompt or a question a discussion um, uh, point um, to the class you're asking them to take a moment um, or a couple of minutes to think about their response to find a partner um, to share the response together um, they can kind of talk about, um, you know, each of their perspectives, and then uh, you offer opportunities for the pairs uh, to share uh, their collective uh, thoughts. And so you can use you can use breakout rooms to facilitate that uh, remotely, and um, you can have people in the classroom uh, pair off um, in person. In colons, depending on the size of the class, colon selected group, you could ask someone in breakout room number five or breakout room number 70, if you want, yeah. um, to report back on the responses. And you can call people randomly from the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way of participating. Again, if you're in a large room that's not well mic, you may have to repeat what the people in the room said. But for people remotely, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, so, you know, you can use uh, virtual whiteboards. Um, so we'll actually have an example of that here in a minute. Um, so things like jam boards um, and uh, using those QR codes for people who are in person to access those whiteboards um, are another way to, you know, get students brainstorming or to share their ideas um, in a, you know, pretty, pretty cool um, organized way for um for them to share across modalities and there are a lot of good tools out there jamboard is built into google yeah we One always thing talk we discovered you. at cit which had not been an issue in previous sessions is that because most of this time the people use this people in professional development have generally used this really extensively during a pandemic as a way of bringing remote only people into the discussion uh, and it works really well for that but an interesting thing with jamboard um, as I saw last week was, and in fact, one of our colleagues complained about this, was that if you put up a QR code and someone's trying to join from a mobile device, it prompts them to install Jamboard on the device. And people who were new to this were really remarkably reluctant to open and load that. It never was an issue for many people in professional development because we, as soon as we heard about Jamboard, we installed it on our mobile phones and tablets. But um, it works well when people are on a computer. You share the link, it opens in the web browser. But on an Android or an iOS device, you have to actually install the Jamboard app. And that worked really well. Um, and, um, and there's a message here that says, what about Packback? Packback is a great discussion tool, but it's not synchronous. So we're trying to focus mostly here on synchronous discussion. Uh, where people are interacting in real time. Uh, Packback is a great tool. It's incredibly expensive. One of the most expensive tools you can get. Um, if a student, it costs, I think, $22 with SUNY's contract per student per course. So if a student is enrolled in five courses, it's $110 for that student's access to that. Um, it's a great tool, you know, and it adds a bit beyond what's available in regular discussion forums. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's, I used it when it was free as part of the pilot. I stopped because I didn't want to make students pay, basically to make my work a little bit easier. Um, but it, again, it's a great tool. It's very interactive. It's a much more modern interface. But then so is actually the interface for discussions in um, 
in Brightspace. Yeah. So, you know, the Brightspace discussion forum is going to be a bit more friendly, but it doesn't have that AI interface that Packback does. So, um, Packback's a great tool. I just wish it wasn't so expensive. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one thing that can work regardless of the modality is you can always have students work in group in real time using any of the Google tools where they're working with text chat and students are used to texting each other. Sometimes they'll be texting each other in the classroom <laughs> anyway. Uh, but yeah, they, so they harness can, that they, energy into, yeah, into something. It in a productive yeah. way where, you know, one thing that students will often do is if you do happen to be lecturing, um, you can have students take collective notes where they're as a group they're taking notes that's something michelle miller has talked about in some of the podcasts we mm -hmm. did with her you can have students work on slides together where they're jointly working on a presentation for the next class period similarly they could work in google spreadsheets to do some analysis or something similar and you know as long as you can all see it at the same time and they open chat up they can do that now it is possible to have all the students in the room connect to the remote students using um, Zoom or some other tool, but it's a little bit challenging unless they all have headphones and um, and they mute and they're not using the speakers because then you get that feedback loop. Or even then though, if there's a lot of people talking in the room at once, the remote people are going to hear all of the voices, you know, and unless they're, they're very well spaced in the classroom. So that's a little bit more challenging, but text chat can always work and tools like Slack could work as well. Um, well, yeah. And we <laughs> so yeah, using Slack and, you know, other kind of um, back channel communication Google tools. Um, yeah, just allowing students to communicate in different ways with each other, um, you know, you could have everybody, um, you know, log everyone who's in person, uh, presuming that all of the people remotely are already on Zoom. You can have everyone who is in person uh, log on to Zoom, wear headphones and earbuds, um, you know, and essentially, you know, facilitate facilitate the class through Zoom in that way. You could still use fishbowl yeah. presentations where there is a group that does a presentation and. Again, I mentioned in my capstone course, I had students, do, it was a three hour class or two hours and 15 minutes, whatever it was. Um, but every day, each student was in a group that presented on some research that either they had done or some research studies they had read. And they'd work synchronously on their own time. And then they'd come together and present to the whole class. And then there'd be Q and A. And again, in that class, I just had a remarkable number of students who contracted COVID, partly because of ventilation. They were spending three hours in a classroom that had inadequate ventilation. So once one of them got COVID, it spread from the back corner of the room from the window <laughs> all the way up to the front. Um, and I don't think anyone in the class escaped it other than me. And that's probably because I had just had it the semester before and I got my first booster um, and I got the second booster right near the end of the semester. So <laughs> I was able to escape it, but everyone else in the class was yes. out for at least five days. Um, so <laughs> you can do it. But the fishbowl technique works where there's a group presenting and everyone else is around them listening and then asking them questions. And it doesn't matter whether the students doing that are in person or remote. And it worked really, really well, uh, or it can work really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, group presentations are the same sort of thing, which is closer to what my, my class was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you can also um, create opportunities for um, small group workshopping. Um, you know, you'll just want to make sure that any work that these groups are evaluating of each other um, can be done so very quickly um, so that you're, you know, using your time in class um, the most efficiently and effectively for your group. So if you have you know, a short writing assignment, um, or, you know, maybe it's just topics, right, for a project, and um, you get groups together to kind of um, workshop and think about, um, you know, considerations for those topics, and, um, you know, for their projects, and, 
you know, you just uh, want to make sure it can be done within the class period and that every, you know, person in those small groups gets um, opportunities to have their work uh, reviewed by their peers. So if you have students writing a haiku, they could bring it in, right. they could all discuss it and so forth. Or if students are writing a short reaction to something, or if students have, um, are creating, I don't know, something short that can be quickly read because then you can group people in either modality so the remote students can work with other remote students, the groups in person can work with other people in person, and you can still do it. It's a little more challenging than when everyone has the same modality, but it's possible it is. as long as it doesn't require students to do well, as long as you don't have to form groups that you don't know in which modality the students will be there. Right. And that's all we could come up with. I'm sure there's a lot more, and that's what we want to share with you. And what we're going to do here is if you have a mobile device, you can scan that, um, or you can, well, let me, let me grab this and I'll drop it into chat. I meant to do that before, but I didn't um, because we're working on a couple other things. <laughs> so trying to look at some of the things for tomorrow. And um, the link will be there in just a second. Here we go. So if, um, if you open that, there's a, this Jamboard here. And what we'd like you to do is just submit something using a sticky note. Um, let, me, let me get this up so it's maximized again. And if you haven't used the Jamboard before, it's a wonderful tool to use in class. Um, the most common use is just to have people write on a sticky note. So you type something in, you click, um, once you have something out, you click save. If you want, you can change your color. I'll just put, I will call this a sample because I can't think of anything else because we, we brainstormed this yesterday mm -hmm. and these were the things we did. And um, I'm just going to drag this down and you can, again, you can change your color on it. You could rotate it. You could make it bigger or smaller. Um, and you could, and anyone can do that. So, um, or you can rotate it. One moment. And apparently Siri decided to I assist. I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> no, I couldn't, Siri. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it did. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes Siri listens to me. So you can also spin it around and do other things with it. So what things have you done or considered doing in, in this bicronous environment? Um, or uh, the other question is, um, what problems have you had or anticipated with bicronous instruction? We thought maybe we could brainstorm some solutions. We'll give everyone a chance to do it and then we'll talk about it. We'll get rid of the sample in here. And this is a great tool to work in this environment. That, that comment about Kahoot might belong a little better on the other screen, but, but that's okay. We, it's, it's, a, it's an important concept. It's an mm -hmm. important issue. It's a big issue. And to get to the second page, you can just click on this. Go back and forth.
one thing will happen if you use this in a large group, especially, well, it could be any group, there will always be someone who is just very concerned about making everything neat and orderly, and they will go through and they will rearrange these so they're in a nice matrix mm -hmm. format mm -hmm. with nice neat rows and nice neat columns and all equally sized. I have seen that happen in so many uh, uses of Jamboard. <laughs> But we can talk about these as these come in. If, you, if you're writing, continue. Um, the Kahoot thing there about how students log in with a false name. Actually, my most common application of that is what, well, I only did it once, but I let students pick their own names. And what happens is they will, or one of them will pick an inappropriate name. Yeah. You know, and you don't want to do that. So one way of addressing it is at least not having inappropriate names is you can force the use of the random name generator. Mm -hmm. The students who would be likely to cause problems with that will grumble and complain that they can't pick their name. Um, but that's <laughs> one way of avoiding it. Now, in terms of the posting content, that's a little bit tougher if you're using free response. But you know, if the goal is to develop automaticity, you could use numeric responses as appropriate, or you could use matching, or you could use multiple choice, or you could use multiple select, mm -hmm. or things that would not allow them to post content that would be inappropriate. Which, with anything anonymous, particularly in a large group, it's probably better to limit the possibility for inappropriate content mm -hmm. because someone out there, especially if they're freshmen or sophomores, is likely to do that, especially if it's a large group. Yeah. Um, I know there was an issue with that occurring in a freshman orientation thing with the polling app, um, where someone posted something that was really offensively racist. I think oh, we, yikes. You want to limit those options yeah. or that possibility if you can. Um, and then, then the next one that came in was the working on a collecting data for a mapping project. They work collaboratively on a Google Sheet, so they can see who's doing what. And that works really well. I've written a number of papers that way with colleagues who are working remotely, mm -hmm. typically with voice chat going on at the same time, but sometimes with just text chat. If we, Well, for example, if we were at a conference and we were working on something, but we were attending different sessions, we'd use text chat and then we'd be typing in, we could see what the other person was doing. And that can work really, really well, no matter where you are. Um, so that and using any of the Google tools work because you can all edit simultaneously. If everyone's logged in, so you don't have that anonymous hippo running through there, you can see which person is doing it if, if you share it with people and they're logged into their Google accounts. Uh, spelling out the time within the class to, um, to the amount of time to devote to each of the groups in person and virtual. And it will always take a bit longer in the virtual environment because you have to allow for time for them to get to the break room to start talking and to come back. And that adds just a little bit of time. You can cut back the breakout room by default. When you close it, it gives people 60 minutes. You can change that to 10 seconds or something, as long as you tell them in advance that this is the amount of time you have. And in fact, you can set that in advance and you can limit the time of the warning because if they know how long they have, they don't need as much warning. It won't be as much of a surprise. They can see the countdown. So, but it is important to tell them so that they can arrange their time productively that way. And do we have any, any posts here? Okay, uh, about not being able to anticipate or plan for the number of students participating in each modality. That can be an incredible pain. Um, I know there have been many times where I planned activities and, um, and it was a challenge not knowing who was going to be there that day. Um, and the best thing to do is to plan for some alternatives that will work in any environment. So if what you plan doesn't work, coming up, thinking about at least other alternatives that can accomplish the same objective without putting too much of a burden on you mm -hmm. is helpful. But it's and being exhausted, trying to keep an eye on the chat is a constant 
issue, um, especially if you only have one screen. We were doing that this morning, mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was a bit of a challenge, especially because we had the bottom of the tech covered by the, <laughs> the transcript, um, the real time transcript, so we couldn't even see some of the buttons we needed to get to until we we turned that off. Um, and one strategy that um, Derek Ruff has suggested is to appoint a student in class to be what he calls the voice of the chat. And it could be a different student each time. So if you're teaching a moderately large class, you could have one student logged into Zoom with their microphone off so you don't get a feedback loop and just ask that student to represent the voices of the people who are not in the room. And whenever a question comes in, that student could relay the question to you so you could stay up to date with that, with the with the discussion. Mm -hmm. If you happen to have a large class in the TA, I haven't used one for a few years now, but if you happen to have a TA, the TA, you know, an undergraduate TA, they could be the voice of the chat and monitor that on their on their own laptop yeah. or phone and relay their questions or type responses if they could, if they know the response, um, which often yeah. they would. So any other suggestions or issues? Yeah, so I just want to share my experience. I, I didn't, before this workshop, I didn't know that this really had a name. <laughs> I, I only I, learned the name last year, and it showed up in some research papers on it, and it seems to have spread of that. So I used to teach in Syracuse, even before the COVID. So I had this problem with uh, students from downstate. So we had to install some cameras in the Syracuse uh, classroom. So we had some in-person uh, groups. So I discovered that it's difficult to manage these two groups distinctly. And sometimes we spend a lot of time. So what I did was to, before the class, you will share the content and what you need to do for the day, then encourage them to go through it before coming to class. So that when they everybody gets to class, go the online and the in-person groups, the teacher will be doing more of moderation of getting, you know, to know where they're having difficulties. So you spend more time clarifying some concepts, then presenting some new ones that are really difficult for any of the groups to grasp. Because initially, you know, jumping from one group to the other, coming back to the other groups. Sometimes you end up you know, running between the pillar and the post. So when I started sharing that, because I normally hold that class on weekends, on Saturdays. So I'll give it within the week. They have some time to study. Then we'll now come to class and look at the gray areas. So I think that's uh, what I try to do to help manage the time. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good strategy. Having students do as much of that preparation outside of class makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to spend as much time trying to deal with different groups separately. Mm -hmm. You know, so the more you can do that works for both remote and I mean, the easiest thing you could do to have groups in different places is to lecture them. But we know that's not quite as effective. So the more you can get students engaged, the better. But, you know, lecture can be effective, you know, as long as you add some interactivity to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but you want it to be manageable. And that's the main challenge that all these techniques do require a little bit more work and not knowing who's going to be in class on any given day makes it a bit more challenging. And I know there were times when I was surprised to see 20% of the class in class and right, right after the spring break, and then I opened Zoom up, and everyone else was there because there were we. It turned out there were all those travel issues where airlines were canceling a lot of flights, a lot of international flights were canceled, and I had few international students, and they were just stuck. They couldn't get back for a while. So, um, you know, I, I didn't expect to have so few people in the room, but it still worked. But it was a bit more of a challenge. So, you know, the more we do it and the more we start getting equipment, like having two monitors, having better microphones in rooms, the easier it will be. But it's, it's not going to be as easy as having everyone in one modality or the other. Um, I think many of us would much prefer to be in person with everyone in the room. That's something we're most used to. 
we got used to everyone on Zoom. That wasn't quite as great because you know we saw that sea of black boxes on Zoom, and it's um, it's you don't know how engaged people are unless you're constantly interacting with them, which is not a bad strategy. But some of those students, when I was teaching 380 some students on Zoom. I'm not quite sure how many of them were engaged. I know when I called on some specific students, they didn't always or often respond in any way. And, you know, it's easier to tune out when you're in Zoom and, and you don't think it's very likely that you'll be called on directly and just responding when you happen to get a poll question pop up. So. Okay, any other thoughts, any other strategies? John, I'm wondering for a bi-chronus format, have you heard of any classes where the group would be divided into cohorts and rotate days that they're expected to be in person and online? That's one of the ways in which we actually, some classes during the pandemic off, were offered. Um, uh -huh. And it's one of the ways in which actually some hybrid instruction was offered that way at many institutions as a way of saving, conserving the use of class space so they didn't have to build new buildings when they were expanding rapidly. So that half the students would be in person, half the students would be remote, and that has been done. And that works well as long as students have a choice. But I'm not sure we're going to be in a world soon where we, where some students won't be getting um, COVID or where they might not be getting the flu or something else. And, you know, in the past, we used to just record, record classes for them and let them watch it later if they chose to, you know, but it's not quite the same thing as being able to actively engage in the class in real time. Mm -hmm. Watching people take a poll is not quite as effective, but yeah, I mean, that's one way of doing it. Um, a more typical hybrid class, though, actually, and this is what the University of Florida, which or Central Florida, which pioneered a lot of hybrid instruction, did is they would break up the class into cohorts, and one cohort would meet one week or one day of a week, the other cohort would meet the other day. But instead of the others joining synchronously, they would do some asynchronous activity where half the class might have been in person, half of it was online, but they would switch back and forth. So it required half as much classroom space, basically. One room could fit two sections of the class. Um, and it was primarily because they couldn't afford to build more building and they had this expanded student body. So that was a way of handling it. And it, it worked, but it works less well when people are getting sick or where there's other barriers. Right. But yeah, it, I mean, that at least would narrow the choice a bit. And that would make it easier to have a predictable mm -hmm. enrollment. Right. Unless unexpected things like a pandemic pops up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder too if you could maybe give students a certain number of, call them flex days or something like that, like five a semester, um, where they could just switch up without announcing it in advance. Maybe that would help. That could, and you know, and it wouldn't have helped so much for my the one student who ended up in the hospital for literally half the semester who was in and out. But mm -hmm. for, you know, you can make special exceptions in cases like that, but for other students, and in fact, when I was teaching a large class using, I did always stream the class out, you know, it wasn't so interactive, I was just using Knopka way back before we had Zoom at a scale that would allow 400 students to connect. Um, what I did is I dropped the five lowest grades so they could miss two and a half weeks of classes without any penalty whatsoever. Um, and I still allow that. But now it's generally dropping the lowest grade, not miss grades, because most of the students are there in general, um, one way or another. But yeah. although an interesting thing, Liz was using it this semester in her large intro course, and there were a lot of students who were connecting to the polling who were not actually connecting to Zoom. Um, and I had that a bit, but it seemed to have grown as students have discovered they could do that. So students were answering the poll questions, but not actually participating in the rest of the class, which isn't very productive. But yeah, you can certainly allow a certain number of drops and, you know, and that, that could work too. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Accepted, we should go, the high flex course, which is designed for that flexibility. So in a true high flex course, students always have the choice 
of any of those three modalities, either doing something entirely offline without meeting with the rest, uh, doing something in class or doing it remotely. And that choice is entirely up to the student. And that worked really well for students who might be um, people in the military who might be on call, for example, and we've had that happen in classes. Uh, it might be true for people who have a swing shift where they may mm -hmm. be working first shift one week for a few weeks. They may be working second shift or third shift, or they might be doing some traveling for their work, or they might be engaged in healthcare issues for sick family members or, you know, or childcare issues and they can't come in. Or we have a lot of, a lot of faculty and there's a lot of people out there who have children in daycare and then the daycare shuts down because, and they shut down now for 10 days uh, because someone at the enterprise um, tested positive. Uh, I know Rebecca has now had 11 um, shutdowns of her daycare for 10 days each time. So in the past academic year, they've been shut down for 110 days, which again would make it difficult if she were taking courses or for someone mm -hmm. in the family to participate in person. So it's a, it's a challenging time. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, well, we'll stop. Um, thanks for participating. Um, we're hoping the world gets easier. And mm -hmm. we keep saying it'll be better next semester. <laughs> and maybe, well, and it has. Hopefully. I mean, to be honest, I really enjoyed being back in the classroom again uh, this whole year. And I especially enjoyed it this spring when I was working with smaller upper level classes because uh, it was nice to interact with students again. And it was nice to have students with their masks off uh, again. And you know, I, I very much enjoyed being back. And maybe, maybe the fall will be even better. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so.